So this is for the agenda today, we will start with um, an explanation about the closed loop transfer functions and the loop gain. Then we will focus on stability, on its definition and verification, talk about how to measure the stability using the voltage injection method, talking about how to get right measurements by using the injection signal level, how to find out, find out what injection signal level we should choose, and by choosing the right correction point. And we will conclude with some light measurements. We have planned to do it on an LED driver and a flyback, flyback converter. Yeah. Yeah, so let's start with the closed loop feedback system. Uh, we did choose uh, the simplest converter, a bug converter, as an example. So in this picture, you can see the converter itself that has the input voltage and the output voltage, R is the load. Then we have the switch, the two switches, in this case an active switch and a diode and the LC output filter. And from the output, there is the feedback path that goes to the error amplifier that compares the feedback to the reference voltage. Of course, there can be a voltage divider to set the output voltage to a different level than the reference vol voltage, but for simplicity, we just did remove the voltage divider here. Then the error signal goes through a compensator and then into the PWM and to the switch again. And the PWM creates the duty cycle, that's the delta here. So if we look at the output voltage, the small signal output voltage depends on the error voltage, so that's the reference voltage minus the output voltage, that's the error. It's multiplied by the compensator transfer function, then by the PWM transfer function, and by the duty cycle to output transfer function of the power stage. So that's the closed loop reference to output transfer function if we reorder it such that the output and the reference voltage are on one side. And the block that's blue marked in this case, that's the so-called loop gain. And that's the product of all the gains in the loop. So let's reorder this function, reform it, so that we have the trans function from reference to output, closed loop, so that's the CL, closed loop, equals the reference voltage over the output voltage, and that this formula, if you do some simple math, we end up on that formula. And we have two similar blocks, and that's, again, this loop gain. And we call it the loop gain T of S. And that, uh, you, um, again, that's the product of all the gains in the loop. So by replacing the block with the T, we get the very simple, well-known feedback equation. The transfer function is the loop gain over 1 plus the loop gain. And uh, um, for myself, I, I thought about what happens if the loop gain is, is very big. Well, then the total fraction will be close to 1. And this uh, means that the output will follow the reference, and that's actually uh, what we want to achieve. So. Yeah, because then the input voltage does influence uh, the output voltage. So that's why you have a wide input voltage range yeah. for um, yeah. Uh, it's constant output voltage. Or we could, could choose the output to follow mm -hmm. uh, an arbitrary reference. And what Bernhard mentioned is now also visible in this page, where we derive the closed loop input to output transfer function, so from the input voltage to the output voltage. Again, we have our converter, and that has uh, transfer function from input output. Well, we didn't uh, don't derive it here, but there is a lot of uh, a lot of literature, a lot of books where the derivation of this transfer function is shown. And then we add the feedback, and the output voltage is in this case the input voltage times the input to output transfer function, and minus the actual output voltage times the loop gain. So again, we have our loop gain in this equation. And if we reorder it, we arrive 
uh, at an equation that is very similar to the one that we had before. So that's the closed loop input to output transfer function, and that's the open loop input to output transfer function over one plus t, the loop gain. And again, what happens if the loop gain is very big? Well, then this total fraction uh, will be very small. That means that, as you mentioned before, the input yeah, one slide too early. <laughs> <laughs> the input uh, should not have an influence on the output anymore. So input ripples will be rejected, for example. Yeah. So we said we want to have high loop gain to achieve good regulation and good uh, rejection. But some when we will not be able to to to, uh, to have the high loop gain, uh, we won't be able to have that for all frequencies. So at one point the loop gain will be smaller than one, and then the feedback has no effect anymore. Yeah, that's the loop bandwidth. So for very uh, quick changes of uh, the load or whatever, then it would no longer be regulated. Yeah. So the regulator can only react to the loop mm. bandwidth to the crossover frequency mm. of the loop gain. Uh, as I said before, we cannot achieve that high loop gain for all frequencies, and actually we don't want to. Uh, probably there is a lot of high frequency noise, and we don't want to react to that because this will create a lot of distortions. Mm -hmm. So in fact, uh, the loop gain will look somehow like this sketch. We will have high gain at low frequencies to achieve good regulation if we need the good regulation. Then we will have a crossover frequency and there is a design rule that says um, the loop gain should cross the crossover frequency with a slope of minus one uh, or a slope of 20 dB per decade. And uh, the reason for that is that uh, Mr. Bodhi once said, if you cross with a slope of minus one, you can directly calculate the phase margin from that. And if you have minus 20 dB per decade, falling slope, then you have 90 degree of phase margin. So, and 90 degree is very good, so that's the design rule you should cross with the slope of minus one. However, we can measure the phase, so um, this is not that important anymore because we can really directly measure the phase. We don't need to derive it from the loop gain slope. Mm -hmm. And the high frequency gain that uh, should be low uh, in order to damp the high frequency noise. Yeah, and now we come to the point that we are talking about today, the stability. And this time we chose, we did choose a mathematical approach because uh, we did already hold this uh, presentation quite often to, to not have the same thing every year. Um, <laughs> if we look at the two equations, the closed loop equations that we derived before, then we see that in both equations there is the one over, the one plus t in the denominator. Is it the denominator? I guess so, yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> of the fraction, so in, uh, under the Bruchstrich in German. And what happens if the t becomes minus 1? Well, then 1 plus minus 1 will be 1 minus 1, that's 0. zero yeah. <laughs> and a 0 under a fraction is bad, so this number will be undefined or infinite. Uh, denominator is okay, was in the chat, thank you very much. Um, um, so this will be undefined uh, and we, for simplicity, call it now unstable. And to avoid that, we can check the loop gain. So we will need to check how much distance does our loop gain have towards the instability point of minus one. And that's actually everything about the loop gain measurement with respect to stability. Yeah, the phase margin test, that's the actual test that we are performing uh, in order to check the distance. And uh, it's a special case of the general Nyquist stability crit criterion, which I actually never did understand fully. I tried to, but it's quite uh, mathematically and uh, control a lot of control system theory, and uh, I did not succeed in understanding everything. Well, there are some things, some things in life you just have to accept. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. And this phase margin test says if the phase margin is uh, more than zero degree, that closed loop system will be stable. So let's assume that we have a transfer function, 
a loop gain measurement that looks like that. Then we check where is the zero dB crossover frequency and go to the phase and we check how much distance does the, how much phase margin is left until the phase reaches the minus 180 degree because a gain of zero dB is one and uh, minus 180 degree is a minus, so that will be the minus one. I think uh, it's better, better visible, even better visible in the Nike plot, where we have the real part of the transfer function on the x-axis and the imaginary part on the y-axis. And here we have the minus one point directly visible, and the phase margin is actually the angle that we can shift the transfer function uh, until it hits the instability point. There is also gain margin in addition, and that would be the other way around if we go to the minus one angle and then we check how much gain is left, then there's the gain margin. Now, how much phase margin do we actually need? Uh, now, by designing the compensator, you can choose how much phase margin you will end up with. And uh, we have done a very simple small signal simulation on a synchronous bug converter with, uh, with 300 kilohertz switching frequency and 40 kilohertz crossover frequency, and it's actually a voltage mode controlled. And the step response, the first one, we tuned it to have a very nice step response, and it looks like that, so a lot of ringing. I hope you can see it in the presentation. And from the ringing at the step load response, we can also derive the crossover frequency by taking the... Measuring the period, the period of, yeah, of, the, of period. the ringing. And then dividing over the period, that's the crossover frequency. And in this case, the compensator was designed to have... The system was designed to have seven degree of phase margin. So that ends up in high overshoot and ringing. And this is, of course, undesirable. 23 degree looks already better. Some overshoot and one, two, three, four periods of ringing, something like that. 30 degree, one period less probably. 45 degree, that's already a good value. There is only two ringings visible and very little overshoot. And at close to 80 degree, above 70 degree, the system is highly damped. There is no ringing anymore. And if you increase phase margin even further, you will end up with an even slower and more damped system. But uh, you don't have ringing anymore above 70 degrees. If you make the phase margin even be bigger, then the system will just get slower. Mm. Yeah. So why do we measure stability? In fact, first of all, we want to ensure a stable operation at all operating points and at different environmental conditions. So this means also that when you measure stability, you should also measure it with uh, all the load points you will have during real operation. Then we want to achieve um, a low phase margin, as you have seen on the last slide, can add a significant ringing and degrade the system performance. Therefore, it's also important that you have a trade-off between the speed you want to have, you want to react and the ringing you want to see or you don't want to see. And finally, um, especially for linear regulators, uh, we need to have enough stability margin to ensure that the uh, ringing or whatever direct the noise is not uh, adding into clocks or op amps or ADCs uh, that is uh, created by instabilities. And finally, why to measure stability? Because a lot of people do simulation nowadays and Sometimes you also should verify your simulation results. So how can we measure? We can measure transfer functions with the Bode 100. So we have the possibility to inject the signal somewhere in a chain of uh, devices and then pick up a signal at channel 1 and pick up a signal at channel 2 and compare these two signals. So we just fill the ratio between channel 2 and channel 1 and then we get as a result the transfer function of what everything which is in between. So this allows us to measure somewhere inside a chain just the transfer function of a single block inside this chain. Further on, um, 
one thing is important to do this measurement, we need to activate the external reference of the Bode 100, so that channel 1 is used as the reference. And we have to switch the Bode 100 to high impedance to ensure that we do not influence uh, the system with our probes that we are using. Usually in a power system you can use one-to-one -one probes, but um, sometimes you are also would be able to use 10-to-one probes so that even your, uh, your impedance you add here at the point where so you pick up the signal is even bigger. Yeah. So there's less influence. And also the voltage level. So the one-to-one -one probes are limited to non-dangerous uh, voltages if you, if you use or if you have uh, hazardous voltages in your system, we recommend to use active differential probes, uh, safety isolation probes that then have a switchable attenuation of uh, 10 to 1 or 100 to 1, and then you can go up to uh, even higher voltages. Mm -hmm. So how to measure the loop gain? We, um, usually you can measure the loop gain using the voltage injection method. So we virtually break the loop in the, at the beginning of the feedback path here in this example. So we add an injection resistor here and we use an injection transformer to send in a signal into the loop at point B and it drops the entire loop and comes back at the output. And here we pick up the signal again. And by uh, comparing the signal that we receive at point A with the signal sent in at point B, we get as a result uh, the transfer function of the complete loop. Yeah, so um, something to remember is the body measures the transfer function from the point where you connect channel 1 to the point where you connect channel 2. Yeah, so it's channel 2 divided by channel 1. Uh, channel 1 is the input voltage, channel 2 is the output voltage, and so this ratio is the combination of all these elements you see here in this loop. So, but to do so, we need to select the correct injection point. And um, to this is important to keep the measurement error as small as possible. And one rule is that the input impedance you see when you inject the signal should be a lot bigger than the output impedance uh, that you see when you get the signal back. Because then this would mean that there is a limited influence on the, on the system. Um, how to achieve that? Suitable points uh, we will talk will come in a second. Like for example, uh, the output of the voltage source here. Or here you have a very low impedance, and then the input, for example, at the voltage divider is usually high impedance. Or if you have an operational amplifier, the input is always good because it has a very very high input impedance, and uh, also the output of an op amp is good because it has a very low output impedance, and if you are able to get in between two op amps, it's perfect because then you have the combination of, of both. Yeah. yeah, and maybe point number two, this is also so the, uh, the gain you want to measure has to be significantly bigger uh, than the output and input within, uh, the ratio between output and input impedance. Yeah, so it's more difficult to measure small gains correctly than big gains. Mm. And uh, something that's visible from here is that you do not necessarily need to inject direct, directly at the output of the converter, because this is something uh, customers ask us uh, quite often, what do I do if I have an 800 volt DC to DC converter with 200 kilowatt, uh, how can I connect the body to it? And mm -hmm. of course, please not add the 800 volts and 200 kilowatts, you won't be able to modulate that a lot with our 20 milliwatt <laughs> power source. But uh, these high power systems generally have uh, a chain of up amps where they, um, how is it called, they, they uh, ensure good signal quality of the feedback by using filters and up amps. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the signal chain with several up amps and there, there are normally small signal injection points where you can also measure the looping at uh, not dangerous Voltages. Voltages. So, when we read the phase measure, uh, phase margin measurement with the body 100, there is a big difference in comparison to theory. So, we measure the distance to zero degree and not to 180, minus 180 degree. What is the reason for this? Um, 
The reason is that we are operating in a closed loop system, and if the signal is in phase uh, that we send in with the signal that comes out, then we would have an oscillation. Uh, so our instability point is at plus one. You can see this perfectly on this curve in the theory. The uh, open loop gain is defined as uh, the gain of the power supply itself plus the gain of the compensator. And then uh, you see that the error amplifier or the error uh, the summing device is not taken into consideration. That's the reason where if this signal is 180 degree phase shifted to the signal that goes in here, then uh, due to the error amplifier, the result would be that they are both in phase and then the whole system would oscillate. In our system, we break at a different point. So we have this error amplifier inside our system. As a result, we have the minus that um, is, is, which is, reflects the 180 degree phase shift in the system. And therefore, the, the transfer function we are measuring is 180 degree phase shifted. And therefore, our instability point flips from minus one zero to plus one zero in the Nyquist chart. Yeah. So the second thing which is important is that we choose the right injection level. Because even with this low voltage source that you mentioned earlier from the body 100, we can overdrive the system quite quickly. The whole control, control loop design is based on small signal models. And therefore, also our measurement signal needs to be small signal. So, a good rule of thumb is that the measurement result needs to be independent of signal size. In fact, it's not a rule of thumb, it's a must have. So, when you, um, it, there's an easy check to do. When you change the injection level, the crossover point, so the point where the um, gain crosses the zero D point, is not allowed to shift. And um, so you can check this by reducing your signal level and a 10 dB step is usually sufficient to see if you are already in the linear range or not. So when you reduce the signal level for 10 dB and your crossover point moves, then the initial level was too high. And then you further have to go down. And usually what I do is I reduce until the point is no longer moving and then I add 3 dB just to make sure that if I'm not just at the border where it stops moving, so when I can add 3 dB and it's still on the same point and I know, okay, I have reduced far down enough, and then uh, we can make sure that the signal works. But I think maybe during the live measurements we can show that yeah. right away. So now there's always a point. We talked about reducing the signal level, so we have to avoid distortion, so we have to avoid clipping of our signals. We always want to have the nice sine waves. And so what can happen is that in one area, we have noise, as you can see on this picture here. So at low frequencies, for example, we have noise. Uh, but we need low frequencies to ensure that the crossover is at the right position so that we do a real measurement. And by applying the so-called shaped level, we are in the position to add signal at the points where we have noise and reduce the signal at sensitive areas where we need to have a low signal to make a real, a real measurement. And so here you see it's the same regulator. This is before shaped level and this is after shaped level. So by adding the shaped level function, it's possible uh, to reduce the noise in areas and get clean curves. So one thing which already was mentioned a little bit earlier is that we have to do that we have to do in system measurements. So if you want to make sure that your device is stable you need to connect it to its input filter, that it will be connected afterwards during operation, and that you connect it uh, to the right load. But usually load is not constant, otherwise regulator design would be possibly even simpler. So loads will change, and as a result, you should um, measure at all expected load conditions and possibly also at various temperatures, just to make sure that your design is stable. And uh, something else that comes to my mind, uh, if you use a load, if you want to stimulate a resistive load, then please use a resistive load and not an active electronic load in some constant voltage mode or whatever, because these are regulating systems itself and they might lead to artifacts in your measurements that are caused by the, by the electronic load itself. That's not the problem of your control system, but maybe 
a problem of the load. So we might end up measuring the load instead of the regulator. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, for choosing the right injection points, yeah. I will hand over to Florian again. Uh, Florian has prepared several examples, and I will try to hook up our live demo for afterwards. Yeah. So. How do you choose the right injection point? And in fact, it's uh, very easy. I have prepared five examples that are a linear regulator, a fuck converter, a flyback converter, an LED driver, and a SAPIC converter. And the linear regulator, that's a VRTS board from PicoTest. So it's a demonstration board. VRTS is uh, standing for Voltage Regulator Test Standard. Um, and on the schematic, you can see that there is a Darlington transistor, that's the power device, the linear, and then the TL431, that's the uh, controller, and we have a feedback divider formed by R3 and R4 here to set the output voltage, and there is already an R2 in place, that's the injection resistor, where we can inject the signal into the loop and measure the loop gain. So we add the body 100 here with the b 100 to isolate our voltage source from the DC operating point, to not connect ground to some point in there that would be very bad. And then we take two probes, the controller reference to ground, so we, the probes also reference to ground. We pick up the two signals and then measure the transfer function from here to there. The next example, a uh, back converter also a demo board from linear technology in this case. And the output voltage is here, that's 3.3, 2.5 amps. We have here the output C, then here the output L. It's a current mode controller, so there is a current sense resistor. But we are um, interested in the voltage control loop, and that starts here, so the feedback that's the pin 20. We have here the R11, R10, and C9 forming the compensation network. And we inject at the path where we have a single path and backwards the low impedance from the output and forwards high impedance from the 1 meg and uh, 4 pico. Yeah, the next example is APIC converter, and again, it's the same thing. So here, input voltage, then LC, and the output voltage here with the output capacitors. We check where is the feedback pin, that's here, feedback 2. Uh, here we have the feedback divider formed by R1 and R2. It's a single pass, that's very good, so we can measure loop gain and we directly add it here at the output voltage since it's only 24 volts. There is no difficulty to measure directly at the output voltage. Again, channel one here on the feedback side, channel two on the output side, and the BV connected to a added resistor. A flyback converter demo board, again from linear technology, and this one already has a resistor that is in place to measure the loop. That's very nice. Thank you very much for that. We have here the output voltage that is transferred to the feedback network. So it's an optocoupler feedback. It's a secondary side regulation. And the feedback network is here, the R14 and R13. That's the feedback divider, then the B12. And here we have some additional Cs and Rs for the compensator, and the R15, that's a zero ohm resistor that's already in place, designated for the loop gain measurement, so we can directly add our measurement setup here. And there are also no directly parallel paths that are responsible for any feedback, so we have a, um, one single path. Another example, an um, LED driver, and that's the first measurement we will do afterwards, I think. Or maybe the second one, we can also do the flyback first. The flyback that would be, I think, uh, this one, yeah. 
And here, that's a little special, a little different, because it's actually also a voltage converter that takes a voltage that is proportional to the output current as feedback. So here the R sends 2, that's the current sends resistor. And there is a differential voltage feedback that's formed by uh, I sends positive minus I sends negative. And this voltage is proportional to the current flowing through the LED. And this creates an output voltage again. So it's actually a voltage controlled converter that controls the current. So current controlled voltage converter. Yeah. The special thing here is that we have to use differential probes in order to pick up the differential signals that we are interested in. So the feedback signal is actually the differential, differential voltage here, and the output signal is the current flowing through the LED that we can pick up by measuring the differential voltage at the current sense resistor, and then we get the loop gain of the system. So we only have to add a resistor in the I sense positive path. And uh, until now, we did not yet talk about the size of the injection resistor. It's not that important, but it should be small compared to all other resistances uh, in the network to not influence the system. And we usually take a 5 or 10 ohm resistor. Yeah, so Bernhard, are you already prepared for the live measurement? Yeah, yeah. I think, the load. I think you can start with the software, yeah. with the body, starting the body and do the measurement. And then we activate also the camera to ah, show yeah. the people what we are doing. There is a shortcut here, yeah. then we can bring up the camera, not the left one. Can't work. This one. So now you can show how to hook this up. Yeah. Lots of cables here. Just cleaning a little bit. coming in, uh, does it make sense to measure the current control loop besides the voltage loop of a current mode SMPS? Uh, yes, definitely, and uh, the results are evaluated uh, exactly the same way as it is done with the, uh, with the voltage loop, so you can also measure the phase margin. Uh, because why? Because usually you have uh, sense resistors and these change resistors result also in, in voltages that are compared. So we are in fact just, uh, with, with the late driver example, we'll go into more detail. Usually if there are uh, two loops combined, so if you have a current loop and a voltage loop, uh, you are only allowed to uh, measure one loop at a time. So you either measure the voltage loop or the current loop. And I, I think he was referring to, to uh to a peak or average current mode converter where actually the compensator is only responsible for the voltage loop and the the inner current loop is just this uh, creating the reference signal for the PWM uh, and that's actually not the real control loop, it's just changing the system um, behavior. So where, where normally on the voltage mode there is a, a triangle generator to create the comparator voltage and in the current mode uh, converter, there is the, the current of the inductor creating this signal, and there actually doesn't really make sense. But okay, but I think we need to, uh, to hook up the uh, uh, the board. In fact, we did uh, quite some uh, hooking up uh, this morning because when we entered our webinar room, uh, we found out that our uh, webinar computer started to make really bad noise, and so we had to. Uh, re uh, replace two player, uh, two blowers just 45 minutes before the webinar started. So uh, this exactly was the time we planned uh, to prepare for hook up the board. So we have to do it live right now. And but Florian is already on it. 
Yeah. yeah. So maybe you can explain what you have hooked up. And just uh, move it a little bit such that uh, everything is visible on the camera. So here we have the flyback converter demo board and our voltage source here, the power supply that uh, supplies the flyback converter. Then the cables take the output to the, the, the multimeter that shows the voltage. Then here we have the current. And now I need to check which resistor. That, that's fine, I think. And we will set the input voltage to 30 volts. So let's just take this one to zero and this one to 30. Then we have 30 volts. And then we have the body 100 and the BVIT 100. So here the body and uh, here the BVIT. And the BVD is injecting the small signal, and we have two standard oscilloscope probes that pick up the signal on either side of the injection resistor and go to the body 100 input. Now I switch on the system, and let's see if it blows up or not. And we last check. Yeah, I think everything is fine. OK, great. And here we have. 3.3 volt DC. And we will set the load current to 0.3 amp. So I'll, on the right hand side here, you can see the, the current. So that's 100 milliamps. And what's that amount to? 300 milliamps. 290, 300, something like that. Good, so in this case, I think you can bring up the, the body 100. For sure, we need to do some settings. As I said earlier, it's important that both channels are at high impedance and that they're using external reference. And further on, uh, we need to make sure that we have both traces activated, and on the second trace, we looked at the gain and the phase of the gain. So usually I switch the two diagrams, and then we also need to define start and stop frequency. So we I can start at 100, I think. Yeah. Start at 100 hertz, and we don't definitely don't have to go to 40 megahertz, as we can see here. Uh, there's possibly a switching frequency. I think it's 300 kilohertz. Uh, yeah, so above 100 kilohertz in any way. So this means that we can measure up to 100 kilohertz. It does not really make sense to go higher than half the switching frequency. Oh, except if you want to see the switching frequency, then you can go higher than the switching frequency. But the regulator can only react mm -hmm. to half the switching frequency. So now we would say, okay. Here we would have our crossover frequency, but um, we did not look at the level. So I will now reduce the level by minus 10 dB, and let's see what happens. As you can see, the switch over point has drastically changed. So this means that our initial injection level was too high. So I can right click on the curve, say cursor one jump to zero, and now I'm at the new crossover point, and now I will reduce again minus 10 dB, so the minus 20. And it still has changed. So you see, this was still the high, jump to zero, and now minus 25. And now you see it was stable. So if I increase now, minus 22, still stable, so we're on the safe side. So we have now the correct, uh, the correct point to measure the phase margin. And the phase margin is now at 50 degree of this um, regulator. Now, how can we improve the noise of the curve? There are several things. First of all, um, we can look at the uh, bars here at the uh, at the right right bottom corner of our uh, screen, and here we see that there is not enough uh, not a lot of level at channel one and channel two. So I can reduce the attenuators and in fact, I can go even down to 0 dB, 
And as you can see, the curve is already getting smoother in, in some areas. But here in this area, we still have a lot of noise. The next thing we can do is we can reduce um, the uh, receiver bandwidth. As a result, the signal to noise ratio will improve at the input of uh, the Bode 100. Um, this will slow down the measurements, but also reduce to a certain extent uh, the, the noise we have. But as we can see, there is still uh, some noise at low frequencies, and this is where the shape level comes in. So we use the shape level function, and we click on shape level, and now at the moment you see that the whole signal is at minus 22 dBm. Now what we can do is we see that we need a higher level for frequencies below 1 kHz. So I can enter a point uh, at 1 kHz that says uh, possibly uh, uh, plus 10 dB and then at 1 kHz saying uh, 20 minus zero again. So, and now you see I've programmed the step. So now, and now I can, for example, use this point here, clicking on it. I think you have to take out the noise from the Ah, yeah. No, no, it's okay. And now I can pull this point, do whatever I want. And then I say, okay. And I, okay, now I created too much, too much level, as you can see. So I can reduce here a little bit and maybe add some attenuation again. So, and now as you can see, the phase margin remains unchanged. So we are now still at 52 degrees and we have no more noise in the upper area. So everything's fine. And now if Florian would change, for example, the load, we would see that the load also influences the stability. So Florian has reduced the load now, and as you can see, the crossover point has moved as well. So for example, if we set it to 150 milliamps, we can uh, put the data to memory. Uh, for and now I switch here to data and memory on both on both channels, and now Florian goes back to uh, 300 milliamps that we had before, and now we have a direct comparison uh, between the stability uh, we had before and after. So that's an uh, a thing that really should be done uh, because your regulator should be stable at all load points. Yeah. yeah, so next thing is uh, let's hook up the uh, LED, LED driver. So Yeah, we got a really nice LED driver yeah. from Linear, and we bought a beautiful 50-watt LED. It's a, yeah, you're nice. not allowed to look into it, otherwise you <laughs> get not blind, but uh, you can't see for a while. Just a, you only will see a white dot. And as I said before, uh, in this case we need a differential probe. Since the feedback signal is a differential voltage that is proportional to the current that flows through the LEDs. So I take my differential probe. Okay, here they are. Channel 2 and Channel one, and the LED driver itself is this little guy, and I hook up the supply. I need a different supply now. I need more current, more power. It's uh, actually a boost converter that boosts the battery voltage, the, for example, 12 volts from the car battery, to the LED voltage that's uh, up to 57 volts at one amp. So I need to think a little bit now. It's so ground. While Florian is hooking up, I can show you the circuit again. 
So we are, this is how we are hooking up at the moment. Uh, you see that we have an LED plus and an LED minus. And we have here a small resistor to measure the current. So this resistor R is 2. It's a shunt resistor with 0 0.1 ohms. And on this resistor, uh, you have a positive voltage uh, current sense and a negative current sense. So in fact, what we are measuring is again a voltage. It's the voltage uh, between these two pins, between the positive and the negative current sense. And so um, what we can do is we can inject our distortion at the positive uh, current sense. So this simulates an output ripple to the regulator, and the regulator thinks, so oh, I have to react, I have to do something. And um, then we can measure what remains of the inj injected signal when the signal comes back to the resistor. The only thing is, um, in fact, we are here, we have to reference um, against the negative uh, current sense. The reason for this is that we are looking here at the voltage between these two pins, and therefore our two probes also need to be referenced on, on this uh, negative current sense. So, I'm nearly, nearly ready. I'm nearly ready, so I can bring back the camera again. Yeah. Um, so, where's the camera? This is the camera. Yeah. So, here on the left hand side, you see this uh, big fan cooled thing that's the LED. And it's really bright. Yeah. And last, last year, we managed to kill a board right between the first and the second webinar. So, this year, we got spare boards. <laughs> but hopefully, we don't need them. Do we also have spare LEDs, Florian? Yes, we have a spare LED. <laughs> we have a spare LED as well. Okay. Okay, so I will... Ready to switch on? Switch on the system. And oh, okay. the LED wow. is already shining. It's, it's really bright. So, you can't, can't see it on the screen, but it is really, really bright. In fact, the first, uh, at the moment, you can see that there is a stone under the LED. The reason for this is, despite of the fan, we first put it on our soldering mat that we have here, the plastic mat that we have, the EMC protection mat, and after uh, a few minutes there was smoke and we were first afraid, oh my god, the board is, is killed is again, is burning, or the yeah. LED is burning. But in fact it was just so hot that our, our, uh, table. our table started to burn. Yeah. <laughs> so actually it's also emitting some, some infrared light, <laughs> I think. Yeah. Bernhard, I think you can ah, the yeah. body is already running and yeah, uh, we so should do the, the measurement. Okay. I probably hooked it up the wrong way. <laughs> Moore's law. And then just use this two. Okay, I can switch up. I just uh, switch channel two and channel one. The good thing here is both probes are very similar, so I can switch them without having to calibrate probes or anything. Yeah, I think the injection level is a little bit too high. So then we need to add an accelerator. I'm afraid of the LED. Can you, yeah, you are shaped level and plus. Ah, okay, 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 you're right. So let's just go to regular level again. Okay, now no, it doesn't sound that bad anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I just clear this memory uh, because this is from the last measurement and also remove it here. So what we can see here is, again, a crossover point. So we can use the jump to zero function again, just to make sure that we are at the right position. And uh, further on, uh, what we can check is if the injection level is correct, so we are already at the low level, so let's go to minus 18, so go up a little bit and see if it changes did not change, so we can use the optimize function to see the curve a little bit better, same here. And so this would be a phase margin of nearly 100 degree, yeah. so we wouldn't see any ringing at all. Yeah. And quite fast, so 4 kilohertz crossover frequency, so this system, this LED can follow transients of the input voltage probably mm -hmm. quite fast without seeing any flickering. Mm -hmm. And again, if you go to shape level, 
uh, we need to be a little bit more careful now. So um, I will, we will reduce here the level. So now I can go and let's just add 10 dB instead of what I had before. And yeah. can you click OK, please? Okay. So it has already slightly reduced also the point where I. I think it's too much. It's Alex. still too much, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't sound very good. Okay, I will reduce it further. Yeah, I think it's also uh, my power supply is uh, at the edge. <laughs> so you can even hear the the fan blowing oh, yeah. slower when you are injecting at uh, at 100 hertz. So okay, please I'll use less to regular level and less uh, signal. Less signal, okay. So, um, in in fact, these were these were the measurements that uh, can be done. Uh, we are five minutes to the hour, so let's uh, continue with the last few slides, and then we can go into uh, questions. Oh, there's a question that has already arrived. What's the main cause of LED drivers typically moderate crossover frequency and not more? Simpler, cheaper error amplifier, but I think it's generally people try to make the system as fast as it has to be. And if you don't need a very fast system, just make it slower. That makes things easier. What is the maximum frequency the human eye can see flickering? It's a lower hertz. Yeah, something like that. So well, yeah, because of the movies. So yeah. Yeah, but uh, actually I heard that uh, that they have to be very fast sometimes. Uh, um, if a very expensive car like an Audi or a, uh -huh. or a Mercedes or something like that is uh, driving in a movie and they're filming it with high-speed cameras uh, or with, with uh -huh. fast frame rates and then the <laughs> frame rate matches the uh, ah, this something. Is, this is like the wheels turning backwards on, yeah, the, yeah. on the old uh, Western movies. Yeah, and then the light can <laughs> can flicker, so they have to be very careful with the dimming frequencies and and uh, and also with the the frequency the system can react. Okay, but in, in reality, um, yeah, yeah, I'm not an expert. In we are, we are not we are not uh, building this stuff. We're measuring it. So, uh, but good question. So there's the next one coming in. Yeah, can I use the Bode 100 for measuring low negative signals? I have a discrete negative high voltage linear regulator. All low voltage electronics is powered between ground and minus five. So all signals stay between zero and minus five. Mm. Uh, okay, my initial answer negative? would be no problem. no problem. Yeah, it doesn't matter if it's a positive or negative voltage. I don't see a problem at all. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's the same way as positive voltage. Yeah. Since we are measuring AC signals, it's only the DC offset uh, that's negative and yeah. I think that's no problem. That's no problem for the body 100, as long as it's below minus 5 volts in any way. Yeah, any other questions? If not, we can continue with the slides now. And if you have additional questions, you can, uh, you can uh, ask them mm -hmm. afterwards. So that's here with the, with the slides. OK. So. So uh, there's one question you always have to ask yourself, what if you can't break the feedback loop? Because this can happen, for example, if you have integrated solutions or if you already have uh, a system installed and, for example, in a satellite, Steve from BicoTest is always telling us the satellite example where he measured power supplies that are inside the satellite already ready for launch and he found out that some of them were unstable. But it's, the problem is you cannot tell them, hey, I need to put in an injection resistor now. So first thing, always, if you have the possibility on a board, put in an injection resistor, even if it's two cents more of cost um, for the board, because then you can measure. And the other thing is, if you not, do not have an injection resistor, you have no access to the feedback loop, there is a method that is called NISM, non-invasive stability measurement. This was uh, developed by Steve of PicoTest, and it's included in the Bode 100. And so you can find out more about this method, which uses a modulated load, a modulated current injector at the output of the device. So you just measure the output impedance, and then you can derive 
the stability of the circuit from the output impedance plot. So visit the PicoDev page to have a look at it. Finally, we also have a small board where we have already done measurements, so measurements are available. And this is the so-called voltage regulation test standard. And this board um, is available for free to everybody who sends us an email with the subject VRTS. So, and some context details. And uh, yeah, the context details are important, otherwise we don't know where to send the board. And uh, we have already some app nodes which are using this board, and all our power supply app nodes can be found using this link. And you do not have to write down this link because everybody who attended this webinar will get uh, these slides in PDF format where this is a clickable link. Yeah. And also there will be the recording of this webinar, well, or maybe the one we have in the evening in English, depending yeah. which one we screwed up less, <laughs> uh, will be also online. Yeah, and yes, you will get the PDF. There was a question, can you have the slides later on? Yes. So, and this is finally the possibility to ask questions. Now you feel free to send them either to Omicron customer trainings or to Bernard Baumgartner, which is my second computer, which is on the side here. So, yeah, we will stay in for the line for an additional five minutes, I think. Um, and uh, if no questions, if you don't have any additional questions, we wish you a very nice day. And uh, maybe hear you or see you, well, you can hear us and see us. <laughs> <laughs> maybe let me meet you again tomorrow, uh, where we show how to analyze passive components using the Body 100. And yeah. the day after tomorrow, um, we focus on audio frequency, audio system frequency response measurement. And there is also a presentation from Ali that is about the PID controllers in power systems and why they are generally not the best choice.